step back in time to 1966, where the Munsters, everyone's favorite ghoulish family, hit the big screen in a riotous adventure titled Munster Go Home. This film takes our spooky friends out of their familiar TV haunt and sends them on a hilarious journey to England. As the Munsters navigate their way through the British Isles, you're in for a treat. Brace yourself for a roller coaster of emotions as funny, shocking, and even a bit somber moments unfold on the screen. The question is, which scene will linger in your mind long after the credits roll? Is it the humor that tickled your funny bone, or perhaps a surprising twist that left you wide-eyed? Now, fasten your seatbelt because there's a lot more coming your way. Keep watching, and you might uncover unexpected gems in this classic film. And don't forget to share your most cherished memory or personal experience related to this movie in the comments below. We'd love to hear your stories and thoughts. What moment from Munster, Go Home, has left a lasting mark on you? Your tales might just be as entertaining as the Munster's own escapades. So, spill the beans and let the memories flow. Stay tuned for more monstrous fun and remember your stories matter. Now, back to the Munster's misadventures in jolly old England. Munster, Go Home, receives a mixed assessment, earning a rating of 1.5 stars out of 4. The film follows Herman Munster, portrayed by Fred Gwynn, as he inherits a sizable castle in England. Accompanied by his family, including Lily, Grandpa, and the kids, they embark on a journey only to discover that another family seeks to claim the castle for themselves. Released a year after the cancellation of the television show, the decision to transition the Munsters to the big screen did not prove successful as reflected in its underwhelming box office performance. The movie's flaws, however, are not primarily attributed to the Munster characters. The initial 25 minutes effectively capture the family's reaction to the news and their subsequent voyage reminiscent of a TV episode. The film encounters challenges upon their arrival in England, marked by a swift decline in quality. The introduction of the other family becomes a source of annoyance, lacking humor and depth. Marilyn's romantic subplot fails to engage, as her relationship with a man whose family disapproves of the Munster family adds little to the narrative. Running at an extended 96-minute duration, the film's length contributes to its issues. Additionally, the decision to shoot in color, while not inherently problematic, detracts from the charm of the Munster characters. In black and white, the spoof of the Universal era is more effective, whereas in color, the characters appear out of place and at times comical. Despite these shortcomings, the performances are commendable, with a nod to John Carradine for his role as the caretaker, skillfully concealed beneath makeup. In conclusion, Munster, Go Home, struggles to replicate the success of the TV show, facing challenges in pacing, narrative, and the adaptation to a color format. Munster, Go Home, introduced audiences to the Munsters in vibrant Technicolor, departing from the black and white format of their earlier TV escapades in the Munsters. However, the transition to the big screen didn't translate into commercial success during its theatrical run. Richard Dawson, the later host of Family Feud, found himself making occasional self-deprecating jokes about his involvement in this Munster flick. John Carradine, taking on the role of Cruikshank in the movie, had previously graced the Munsters as Mr. Gateman, showcasing his versatility in playing distinct characters within the Munster universe. Munster, Go Home, faced mixed reviews, securing only a 1-5 star rating out of 4. Released post the TV show's cancellation, the film follows Herman Munster, played by Fred Gwynn, inheriting an English castle, leading his quirky family on a comedic journey. Unfortunately, the movie's shortcomings become apparent after their arrival in England. The addition of another family seeking the same castle lacks humor and depth, proving more of an annoyance than an engaging plot point. Marilyn's romantic subplot, entangled with disapproving in-laws, contributes little to the narrative's appeal. The film's extended 96-minute duration exacerbates these issues. While the performances, including John Carradine's Hidden Under Makeup, are commendable, the decision to film in color seems to detract from the Munster character's charm. In contrast to the black and white TV era, the color format makes the characters appear somewhat out of place and unintentionally comical. In conclusion, Munster, go home. Struggles to capture the essence of the beloved TV show, stumbling in pacing, narrative, and the adaptation to a color palette, Despite the setbacks, the film offers a glimpse of the Munsters in a new light, showcasing the challenges that arise when familiar characters step into a colorful cinematic realm. 
In the movie Munster, Go Home, Herman and Grandpa find themselves in a tight spot, locked in a counterfeiting room. In a humorous nod to their past collaborations, Herman exclaims, Call Batman, followed by a reference to the show Car 54, Where Are You? This choice of dialogue not only adds a touch of nostalgia, but also highlights the competitive landscape of 1966, with Batman being a direct rival to the Munsters. The success of Batman may have played a role in the decline of the TV series, affecting its viewership. Yvonne DiCarlo, portraying Lily Munster, dons a different shroud in this film compared to the TV series. The decision to create a unique costume was made by the costume designer, aiming to offer a fresh look for the big screen adaptation. DiCarlo's son, producer Bruce Morgan, sheds light on this creative choice, emphasizing the effort to distinguish the movie from its television counterpart. Released in the United Kingdom as a supporting feature for Norman Wisdom's film press for time, Munster, Go Home, faced a distribution quirk not gracing all theaters. Some cinemas opted for, and now Miguel instead. This selective release strategy adds an interesting layer to the movie's history, showcasing its varied presence in the UK cinemas at the end of December 1966. The film, despite its notable moments and nods to the Munster's legacy, received a mixed assessment. The decision to transition the beloved TV characters to the big screen did not yield the expected success. The narrative, initially capturing the Munster family's reaction and voyage, encounters challenges upon their arrival in England. The introduction of another family and Marilyn's romantic subplot failed to engage, contributing to the film's underwhelming performance. In conclusion, Munster, Go Home, grapples with the pitfalls of adapting a beloved TV show to the cinematic realm. Despite commendable performances and a nostalgic touch, the film struggles with pacing, narrative depth, and the shift to color format. It stands as a unique chapter in the Munster's journey, offering both moments of humor and challenges in the vibrant Technicolor landscape. Despite the allure of England in Munster, Go Home, Butch Patrick crushes the illusion for fans, revealing the Hollywood reality that the supposedly British scenes were filmed on a studio lot. The disappointment is palpable for those who believed in the authenticity of the English backdrop. The movie's lackluster performance at the box office proved detrimental to Paramount's plans. Initially considering a theatrical version of Get Smart, the studio pivoted to a three-part serial, A Man Called Smart, reflecting the financial struggles faced by the TV movie. A recurring question for Butch Patrick centers around Eddie's werewolf doll, Woof Woof. The revelation that it resides in a private museum in Indiana adds a layer of nostalgia for fans seeking remnants of the show's legacy. Munster, go home, may not have soared at the box office, but it did introduce the Munsters in vibrant Technicolor, a departure from their black and white TV escapades. The decision to shoot in color, however, wasn't without consequences. The characters, once seamlessly spooky, now appear somewhat out of place and unintentionally comical in the colorful cinematic realm. In a quirky twist, the movie includes a memorable scene where Herman and Grandpa find themselves locked in a counterfeiting room. Herman's exclamation, called Batman, pays homage to the competitive landscape of 1966, highlighting Batman as a rival to the Munsters. This nod adds a touch of nostalgia to the film, acknowledging the challenges faced by the show in the changing entertainment landscape. Yvonne DiCarlo's unique costume in Munster, Go Home, was a deliberate choice by the costume designer to offer a fresh look for the big screen adaptation. The effort to distinguish the movie from its television counterpart reflects the creative decisions made to navigate the challenges of transitioning beloved characters to a different format. Released in the United Kingdom alongside Norman Wisdom's film press for time, Munster, Go Home, faced a distribution quirk not gracing all theaters. Some opted for, and now Miguel instead, adding an intriguing layer to the movie's history and its varied presence in UK cinemas in December 1966. In conclusion, the TV movie stands as a unique chapter in the Munster's journey, offering both moments of humor and challenges in the vibrant Technicolor landscape. Its struggles with pacing, narrative depth, and the shift to color format contribute to its underwhelming performance, yet it remains a noteworthy attempt to bring the ghoulish family to a broader cinematic audience.